Good evening, this is John Shaw, and for the next half hour or so, we're once again digging into the archives to find some of the most interesting music interviews of 1981. We go back this week to January and Phil Collins of Genesis, although actually during the interview he had a phone call that his solo single, In the Air Tonight, had gone to number three in the charts. Now that was taken from his solo album, Face Value, and although the album was Phil Collins' first solo project, the idea had been around for a very long time. Yeah, it's been hanging around in the dungeon in demo form for about a year and a half. The demos became masters in a way because I, I transferred the 8-track stuff which I did at home. I transferred all of it to 24-track and then carried on overdubbing. So if someone says how long has it been in the making, it's very awkward to sort of put a time on it because it, you know obviously it started at home a long time ago. And uh, I guess it took about three months in the studio to record it. Mm, the very fact that I think you've used three studios and an awful lot of session musicians tends to indicate that there's been a lot of effort put into it and yeah. uh, it's been put together over a long time. Did you deliberately want to go over to New York for the uh, Earth, Wind and Fire horns or did you just have to be there and they turned up? No, no, no. And in fact it was LA. It was Los Angeles. I had it all arranged. Oh, no, no. No, what it was... It was three studios, yeah. I mean, if you call my little place a studio, I mean, it's only an eight-track bedroom, really. We did that, and then we went to the townhouse to transfer the tapes and to carry on drums and do a bit of singing. And then we went to Los Angeles, a village recorder. I'd already sort of sorted out that the Earth and the Fire people could do it. And uh, they'd sorted out with their hierarchy that they were allowed to do it because everyone has to consult with Maurice White, you know, because what they do is pretty sort of much a uh, trademark, and so they can't throw it around in the wrong direction. And we also did some vocals and some guitar and bass stuff. So it was spread out over a long period of time. And then we came back to London to carry on overdubbing, back at the townhouse, and then we got Arif Mardin to do some string arrangements, which he did at Air, Air Studios. So about four or five studios we used in all. Yes, did you notice much difference then between the studios? Did you go to any particular places for a specific sound? No, I went to LA really because A, my girlfriend, who now lives with me, but she lived there. So it was, you know, if I had to go away, I might as well go to somewhere where I had, you know, my girlfriend. And also the Earth and the Fire people base themselves in Los Angeles anyway. And Steve Bishop lives in Los Angeles, and Alfonso Johnson lives in Los Angeles, and so does Daryl. So I think uh, I, I put all that together and thought, I've got to go to Los Angeles, you know, I'm not a fool. <laughs> so I did that, really, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I went. But I'd never been to the Village Recorder before, and uh, Fleetwood Mac basically built the place to do uh, Rumours and, and then later Tusk. And it's, okay, it's quite a nice studio, yeah. It's quite a nice studio, but I mean, I, I like the townhouse in London, actually. I think it's one of the best London studios there are. Yes, the overall sound of the album is a very spacey one, isn't it? There's a lot of space there, so you yeah. can hear the various instruments. Yeah. That's something which is very different from what Genesis have been doing recently, yes, the we, David we, Henshaw production. We, clus <laughs> we clutter everything up with Genesis. <laughs> no, it's, it's very true, actually. A very succinct point. Excuse me. Um, yeah, no, it is very true. See, with the demos, they, I say demos, I shouldn't really say demos, because with, with the original versions of the songs that I did at home, the voice was put on very early in the recording, and therefore, whatever you put on top of that after the voice had gone on, left the, you, know, you, you knew where the voice was, and so you, you left space for it. Now, with Genesis, especially nowadays, it didn't used to happen in the past when Peter was in the group, but I drum when we were rehearsing. And until more recent days, when we've acquired these drum boxes, which are actually quite versatile, we couldn't actually play. I mean, we, we could, no one could sing, you know. I, mean, only, I either sang or played the drums, and if I sang, then there was no drumming. So what used to happen is we'd get this huge sound, the three of us, or the four of us, as it was, and then try and sort of put a vocal on top in the studio. So there was never as much space as there should have been. I mean, but now we leave more and more to the studio, which means that, um, you know, we rehearse less, in a way, before we go into the studio which means that it's getting better in terms of having a voice slotted in. We, we leave a lot more space now, especially as you know, the new album we're rehearsing at the moment, which is getting even more space. But because the stuff is written by one person, the voice and the lyrics, you know, they're kind of well out front. I had deliberately mixed it out front as well, because I'm fed up with people saying they can't hear the words, you know, and people always say, oh, it sounds good, but I can't hear what you're singing about, you know. So I thought, oh, well, I'm fed up with this, so I'm going to put the voice up. Yes, a lot of Genesis fans are going to be quite surprised by this album because the hallmark of Genesis is a very full sound, uh, a sort of string sound, almost orchestral feel to it all. Right. This is, although there's a lot of arrangements in there, all, the overall sound is a lot more sparse. Yeah, sparse and simple. To a large extent, you see, I mean, I did all the keyboards, 
you know, as a keyboard player, I'm a good drummer. <laughs> I mean, I really like the way I play keyboards, actually, which is why I didn't get anybody else. Like, behind the lines, Peter Robinson played. But like, the things were written on keyboards, on the piano or, or the prophet. And because I don't know the rules, I didn't know what I was doing wrong. So consequently, I will put my hands down somewhere where a pianist or a classically trained keyboard player would not do. You know, he would. I kind of made mistakes in a way, like with sort of inversions of, of chords. And if I tried to teach them to a proper pianist or, or keyboard player, he would play it the right way, but it wouldn't sound right. You know, it wouldn't sound right to me anyway. So I sort of said, well, I'll do all that myself. And there you have it. Hmm. Well, there's a couple of. Uh non-originals on there, although I suppose Behind the Lines isn't original, but it's not the first yeah. time it's appeared. Right. But I was particularly interested, you decided to do Tomorrow Never Knows, yeah. uh, originally on Revolver, but also done by 801 several years ago. Which yeah, version yeah. was it which... Oh, definitely the Beatles version. I never heard the 801 version, but I remember, in fact, no one else has mentioned that, but I remember, um, it was Hugh Padgham, who engineered the thing, he mentioned that 801 had done it. TNK it was called, I believe, mm. yeah. And I never heard it. But... Definitely the Beatles version. I mean, only, only we, I didn't actually, I, I kept referring back to the Beatles version for drum patterns, you know, Ringo's drum pattern on it, and the sound, and we very sort of, in fact, the, the Beatles version is very sparse compared to mine. I mean, um, I just thought that it's a song that was overlooked at the time, and uh, very much ahead, not ahead of its time, but it was ahead of its time, but that's not one of the reasons why I did it. I just figured it's one of those songs where you sort of, you forget about it. It's one of the, it was a bit far out at the time. I think it's a lovely, I mean, I think it's a very melodic song. I really wanted to do it. I did it about a year and a half ago, long before Paul Lennon was, uh, was struck down. And I was a bit worried that when it came out, you know, everyone would say, oh, you know, he's cashing in on it, you know. But in fact, uh, it was done about a year and a half ago at home. I mean, the, the, the idea was there about a year and a half, and I did the keyboards at home. The track was mixed and finished long before uh, Christmas. I'm surprised that you said that the Beatles version was more sparse than yours, because actually I find them very similar. The backward tapes seem to go at about the same time. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I kept referring to it. I could almost have asked George Martin to come in and do it. I mean, I, I asked everybody else I wanted, and they said yes. So it makes me think now if I'd have asked him, he would have come in and just given a bit of advice. Because we did, uh, we just took the horn, some of the horn parts, and some of the Daryl stuff, and some of the kids, uh, and either sped them up or slowed them down or reversed them tried to concoct it in the same way that they would have done. It was meant to be a, like a reverence as opposed to a new version. I wanted to try and bring the best out of the song so that people could say, hey, I, I like this. I want to go back and listen to the original. I'd like them to refer back to the original in a way. Yes, it makes a very interesting comparison because you're using the drum box on that as well, yeah. which Ringo didn't have, obviously, yeah, right. 14, 15 years ago, whenever it was. I'm intrigued why you put that little tailpiece right on the end. If you mm. turn up the volume high, why do right. you hear that particular song? Well, the main reason I did it was because Daryl and I used to do that in the dressing room before we went on stage. And Daryl was a great guitar player. I mean, he, you know, he, he's capable of playing anything. And he, he used to play all these, like, nightclub songs with all the sort of diminished and major sevenths and stuff. I used to sing it, and he used to play it. And so when it came out, I thought, I'm gonna, let's, get, let's put this on the album. And originally, it was about three verses long, which is a bit too long. But I thought it'd be nice to have a little taste after Tomorrow Never Knows, just sort of in the distance, you know, somewhere over the rainbow. Because basically, I mean, it's related in a way to Tomorrow Never Knows. Just a little touch. I mean, it's just one of those things where I think, you know, I never get a chance to do it again, so I might as well do it now. Phil Collins in nostalgic mood on face value. But back in January, were there any plans to play extracts from the album in concert? There are some plans. Um, well, I say there are plans. There are no dates, but I mean, there are plans. It would be nice to do gigs. I spoke to Daryl. He wants to do it. And uh, Alfonso I haven't spoken to, but I've written to him. Chester would play drums. I've asked him, and he's into it. Uh, I'd play keyboards and sing, and Peter Robinson would help me out on that, because he played on that behind the lines, but he's a good friend of mine anyway. Uh, Shankar's very keen to come out on the road. And I've actually got another project going with him as well, an, an album of his, which I'm helping out with. And uh, the Earth, Wind & Fire horn section, they uh, rung me up. I mean, we talked about doing gigs. I mean, they, they loved the album, and they really did enjoy playing on it, uh, which I'm flattered by, because they, you know, they don't, I'm only a little white boy, you know, and they, they usually play with all the big blacks, you know, like the Jacksons and sort of uh, the Emotions and Maurice White stuff. So I'm very pleased about that. Yeah, they, they're very keen to do some gigs as well, and I don't really want to do it unless I can get the right band together. I don't want to go out with some limp horn section that can't sort of cut it, you know, um, because they are the best in the world. And it'll have to fit in with Genesis plans, because we're recording. We've just built a studio of our own. 
and it will be finished by the end of February. So we're going to be recording from February till it's finished, which could be May, May, June. And Tony Banks' wife is pregnant, so that might put our touring schedule a bit out. Uh, so maybe it'll be June. It'll be sometime, hopefully, before Genesis gone on the road, because I'd like to catch it while the album's out as opposed to forgotten. Mm, so are you hoping to do a fairly substantial British tour? Is it going to be a case of Wembley? This is for me. Or for Genesis. you, yes. Um, I guess if I got everybody over here, I mean, I might, I'd do a few dates. I mean, I'd, I'd really like to play in America with it as well. Well, it depends how, how it takes off, you know. I mean, I mean, I didn't think the single was going to do the way it has done. So if the album comes out and does as well, then I'm obviously going to want to play it. You know, there's no talk of the band splitting up, nothing like that. I mean, we're all sort of in the process of working on this album and we're all very happy together. It's just, um, I feel very, very proud of the album and I, I want to sort of give it as much of a chance as possible. And if you've got all those people together, I guess it would probably be a London date, you know, a Birmingham or a Manchester date and a Scottish date. And then maybe New York, Los Angeles and maybe Chicago or something. And maybe something, you know, but then, then Germany sort of ring up and say, hello, <laughs> how about some dates, you know? <laughs> and then Japan and Australia ring up and, you know. So I don't know. It's all up in the air. I mean, I'd love to do some dates. But, I mean, only if I can get the right band. And it, it, that's obviously a lot of time schedules, you know. I mean, there's Earth and Nefara doing a tour themselves. They're coming over in April, which is why it would be good for me to do it in around that time, April, May, June. So, plans for a possible Phil Collins solo tour. Mm. One name you didn't mention when you went through those musicians was John Giblin. Uh, he plays bass on the album. Yeah. Uh, is he part of those plans or is he doing well, other things? I don't know. I mean, John and I go back a long while. I shouldn't really be talking about him like this because he's a good friend of mine. I mean, I, I would like to use Alfonso. I mean, both John and Alfonso are very... I mean, Alfonso is obviously a wonderful player. And John is really, you know, he's definitely the best English bass player I know. And if Al couldn't make it, you'd John would be the ring up, the bloke I'd ring up. But um, it makes it easier if I use Al in a way because he's a little more spot on ball, you know. And also he lives down the road from Daryl and the Earth, you know, the Earth and the Fire people. So it makes it a little easier to sort of have everybody in one place. Chester lives there. You know, just it's logistically, it's, it's, it's easier. But then he might be out on the road with his own band, so John may well be playing. Mm -hmm. I was very pleased with John's contribution, actually. Uh, he actually played on a couple more tracks than we actually used. I ended up sort of asking Alfonso to have a go as well, because what I wanted to do was to sort of let everybody have a crack at it, and then whoever worked the best. John played on the more Beatlesque tunes, and Alfonso played on some of the more black tunes, you know. Mm, yes, he's certainly got a lot of work recently. He's come to prominence very quickly over the last three Giblin. or four years. John Giblin. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, I mean, from Brand X, John Anderson, P. Gabriel. Mm, great bass player. Glad you mentioned Brandex because that's one of the many projects you've had going over the last few years. And at a, a quick thought, you've had uh, the Brandex project, you've been working with John Martin yeah. on his album, you've actually been drumming with Mike Oldfield as well. Right. You've now got this Shankar project. Mm. Presumably you like this diversity because Genesis really can't provide the, the differing styles of drumming which you like. That's very true, yeah. I mean, I did Mike Oldfield's thing purely because, I mean, he was produced by Dave Henshaw on his last album. I, did, I just went along to his house and uh, basically, I mean, I'm not a big fan of Oldfield. I love Tubular Bells, but I, mean, I, don't, I haven't heard anything else of his since then. And it was purely because of David. And uh, I enjoyed the track I played. Well, I played on three tracks, I think. I actually did Arrival, but I think he redid the whole thing, and so I wasn't on that one. Sheba, I think, is a wonderful song, beautiful song. That's my favourite one. I, I played, the other one I played was Tor or something. John Martin, you know, I, I, is, uh, I kind of... Genesis and myself was obviously my two priorities. Uh, and John Martin's the next one, I mean, well before anybody else. Um, I think I, I'm very close to him as a person, and uh, we get on great. And his music is wonderful, and it's good fun for me to play, because all I do is play drums, to be honest. I mean, he drags me on the singing every now and again. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's good fun to do, but it's only one tune. But playing-wise, it's so loose, you know, and it's just, you can't rehearse. I mean, you know, it's impossible. You rehearse what you can until you're blue in the face, but you still go out there and just do it the way he does it. And it's good fun to do it. So, I do like the, the doing as much as possible. I, I, the only one side of me that I I wish I still had a chance to play with was with, with Eno, and who I haven't seen for a few years now. I find that you know a shame because uh, we didn't fall out or nothing. I mean, he just he went to New York to live for a while, and then he got in talk, involved with the Talking Heads and you know, the Blondie thing and everything like that. And uh, Basically, I don't see him anymore. Mm, funnily enough, it's Eno who sings Tomorrow Never Knows on that 801 yeah, album, yeah. so we must dig that out again sometime. I'd like to hear that, actually, because if he, if he sings it, I'm a big fan of Eno.
big, big fan. Mm. Yes, it was interesting what you were saying just a minute ago about John Martin uh, and the looseness of a performance by him because you played only recently at uh, Loughborough University mm. when you came on stage and uh, played for the whole set with him, actually. Mm. And I thought then that you were feeling really relaxed and just enjoying playing yeah. drums. Of course, two percussionists, actually, on that occasion as well. Yeah, well, Jeff Allen, that's his, that's his regular drummer. It's his brother-in-law, and uh, well, it's not a regular drummer. I, I mean, for the last year and a half, I've been his regular drummer, to be honest. And I did the album, and we did a tour before. After the album was finished, we did a tour, and then he did this big tour, just recently, which is the Loughborough gig, and uh, he wanted me to do it, but I couldn't really do the whole tour. It's about a thirty-day tour, and I had other things I had to do, so I said I'd do the London date, and I'd do a warm-up date, for, you know, so that he could, didn't go on cold, you know, with a new drummer. And Jeff Allen moved, just moved over. I mean, Jeff and I are good, good mates, and you know, Jeff moves over to percussion any time you know, John wants me to play. And hopefully I'll do his next album as well. But I think he might be moving to America, which it doesn't necessarily mean that I won't do it, but I mean, uh, obviously it's a bit more complicated to arrange. So that's when we last saw you on tour locally, or on stage locally, should I yeah. say. You were hinting that there's, there's going to be a Genesis tour, perhaps late summer, something like that. Is that going to be a tour like the last one was, or is it just going to be back to the big halls? Well, no, I mean, it won't be a, a tour like the last one, purely because of time. Mm. We haven't been to Europe for a couple of years, and the reason we did the big tour of England was because we hadn't played in England for the same kind of reason, you know, two years, three years. In fact, it was three years, because 77 was the last tour we did. So I don't think any of the people can expect us to play a big tour this time. We'd all like to, and it's not like going back on our word. I mean, half of the reason we played these small places is because of the change, you know, just a change. You're not an automatic pilot all the time. These big halls that you can't, you feel very impersonal in sometimes. Sometimes they can be very intimate, but other times, you know, you just feel like you're playing to one person, you know, which is the audience, you know. Now, I don't know what we're doing. We're talking about doing something at Milton Keynes, but I don't know, you know, like three nights. There's enough room for people to come and see us. And it's not as big as Nebra, it's only about 30,000 people. And it's a natural amphitheatre, apparently, so I've not been there. But uh, they tell me it's, it's a very nice scene for a man. I don't know. I don't know what to do, really. I mean, I do like playing these small places, but I say we've got to go to Europe. And we should do a small tour of America. We've got to go to Australia. And we've got to go back to Japan. In between all that, obviously, we've got to do, you know, a bit of our own things. So, uh, Tony and Mike, it's not as important to get their own albums out. But I mean, I really like providing the music to there. I mean, I haven't written much since that this album. I mean, obviously because the Genesis t has taken up a lot of time. But uh, I want to do another album, and so, you know, one could tour if, if you if you've supplied the demand. Uh, one could tour, 380 days in the year. You know, I mean, uh, 25 hours a day. It's uh, if you supply the demand. But for us to enjoy it and look as if we're enjoying it, it has to be done in small, concise, potent sort of packages. You know. We get bored stiff if we played every night, you know, because you, you, know, you can't change the set every night because there's things like lights and sound people that need to know what they're doing and sometimes they don't know all the old tunes. So basically, I don't know what we're doing. I mean, I, I, we'd be playing in England somewhere. So as you said, it's, you want to avoid the band being on automatic pilot, yeah. to use your own words. Yeah. Is the new album going to be a different sound then as well, a slight development from the last three or four? Yes, I think so. Everything seems to be um, speeding up. I guess it's always been the same, actually. That's, not, that's probably not true. I was going to say that we do an album a year, and so much happens in that year that by the time you get around and do another one, so much water's gone under the bridge, you know, and so many things have changed, and so many new things have happened, developed sound-wise, or just musical policies and trends. Not that we've ever followed that particularly, and we've always sort of done our own things. But the new album, from what I make of the rehearsals, will be simpler, but that's not to say more rock and roll simpler, just sparser. Tony keeps his ear to the ground, Banksy. He keeps his ear to the ground because he, he listens to the radio a lot. And, he, and he, surprisingly enough, you know, I mean, I don't listen to a lot of music apart from what I'm doing or what I'm doing with other people. So uh, he's been coming up with some stuff that's very different for him. And we're writing together as a group again, you know, like the three of us sort of from scratch. And we've already got enough material for like a double album, really. So if we want to put out a double album, we could do. Or we may just whittle it all down to one. But we found one, one album is very restricting. Time-wise, you know, it's only 25 minutes a side. And there's a whole bunch of areas that we can't actually get out. I mean, like the, the blowing side of the band, you know, like the area on the land, for instance, like Silent Sorrow and Empty Boats and the waiting room, which we all loved. You know, that's really what the band, one of the things the band does best, these little soundtracks, these little pictures. And uh, on one album, there's not enough time to do it. So a double album gives you that little space, you know. You can use certain 
periods, like the end of side twos and the sort of end of side threes, for some sort of stretching out. That's what we like to do, but we won't do it for the sake of it. We won't just sort of double, double album for the sake of it. We'll just see what happens. We're just going to keep recording until we've got to put it out and just choose the best. So we look forward to that. How long is it going to be before we hear that? Uh, it's aimed for September at the moment. Hopefully the studio will be finished. Because we've bought a farm between the three of us. Where the three, we all live in Surrey, and the, so it's very convenient to get to to rehearse. And the roadies live in the house, and there's a barn there for the gear, which we store the gear, so it's all, 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 everything's in one place now. And uh, the studio is in the garden, you know, like it's got a nine-car garage, I think it was, and we converted it to a studio. And it, the conversion's all underway. I mean, it's all, up, it's all nearly finished. And the equipment's been bought, and it's all going to go in there, and it should be finished by the end of February. So as soon as it's all working and we get rid of all the buzzes and clicks, which I'm sure there will be, you know, people trying to start in chainsaws in the field next door, you know, I'm sure that'll break through in the middle of one of our quiet songs. You know, some shaving and stuff, electric toothbrushes. If we can get rid of all that, you know, it should be out in September. Right, well, as I said, we look forward to that. At the moment, we've got face value to listen to. Uh, actually, a lot more varied than Genesis albums have been of late, I feel. Mm -hmm. I think partly because you've got musicians like Ronnie Scott on there and, of course, oh, yeah. Eric Clapton. And I think he contributes to my favourite track on the album, If Leaving Me Is Easy. Yeah, that's one of my favourite tracks. That one, a lot of people like that. But I don't know why. I don't know, um, because, they, because it's good, I suppose. But, but, I mean, I don't know why they like it uh, more than any of the other tunes. It's one of my favourite tunes. I mean, it's, it's got a nice, nice atmosphere to it. That was uh, Don Myrick plays with lovely alto sax on it. And Clapton did his part. He's a neighbour of mine, see, so when we hang around together quite a lot, he came out to my little eight-track, you know, bedroom, as it were, and he put some stuff down. So that's that's strange, you know, because I mean that that track, that particular track, in fact, is quite interesting because it went from my my bedroom with the eight-track with me and Eric to the townhouse where bass was put on it and drums. Then it went and the keyboards were done at my house as well. Then it went to America to get the horns on it. Then it came back to the townhouse for the vocal, and then it went to Air Studios for the strings. So it's really been, uh, that particular track has been around the world. I mean, that's been everywhere, that track. It turned out very nicely. It's really a love song, but I mean, it's one of my favorites.